It's normal that when a new form of, of um, a new medium comes along, a new communications technology comes along, that this is very disorienting to our own hardware. The same thing was true when the book came along. I mean, the book, as compared to the manuscript, was a very powerful technology. And, and one, one could even say, I mean, even in our 21st century world where we claim that everything's so new and everything has transcended everything or everything trans ev transcends everything every 15 minutes, the book is still a pretty powerful technology, even when stacked up against all the things that it's stacked up against now. But think back to, uh, think back to say, the 16th century when the printing press is beginning to make hay. What happens is that people are overwhelmed by new ideas. Um, specifically, religious worldviews are challenged and religions fracture and people fight wars and a third of the European population is killed. So we think about the book and we think that's enlightenment, but enlightenment happens 150 years after the printing press. And in the meantime, an awful lot of Europeans kill an awful lot of other Europeans. So I, I like to take that as the starting point, right? That me new media are going to be destabilizing. And so the assumption that the internet was gonna come along and just take a basically good world and make it faster and more connected and cleaner and so on, that was something that we should have been skeptical about from the very beginning. And, and now, you know, now we're seeing why it is we should be skeptical about it. Okay, so does the internet allow new things or does the internet create a channel for old things? I would, I would say it's rather the latter. Um, we, we, we know, because this is something that people have theorized about since the Enlightenment, that in order for there to be a democracy, there has to be something between you and me and our fellow citizens, something between you and me and our leaders, which is a factual world. We have to have this thing called the public sphere, where you and I and our fellow citizens and our leaders agree, agree that there are certain realities out there. And that from those, reali from those realities, we draw our own conclusions, our own evaluative conclusions about what would be better or worse, but we agree that the world is out there. And that's important for you and I as citizens to formulate projects, but it's also important in moments of difficulty for you and I as citizens to, to resist our leaders. Because if we're gonna resist our leaders, we have to say, on the basis of this set of facts, right? This is the state of affairs, it's intolerable, therefore we resist. If there are no facts, we can't, we can't resist, it becomes impossible. So there are a couple of centuries of democratic theory which make that argument in one form or another. That's an old argument. Um, and th what follows from that is that if you wanna build an authoritarian regime, you, you try to make that factual world less salient. You try to make the world less about the facts that are between you and me and more about the emotions that will either divide us or bring us together. It doesn't really matter which. You, you, authoritarianism depends upon people getting used to hearing the things that they wanna hear. Um, it, it, and what it does is it takes that public sphere and dissolves it, right? It says there aren't really truths out there. There aren't really experts out, out there who can tell you those truths. It's really all about how you feel about the world. And that's true in old authoritarianism and in new authoritarianism. So you know, Germans in the 1930s, who were no less educated than we are, probably more educated than we are, more literate, they got themselves believing all kinds of things that they wanted to believe. And they believed in them, many of them, right down to the bitter end. Um, and, and they got themselves convinced that truth was not a matter of constant evaluation of evidence, but truth was a matter of some larger truth something that made them feel like they were together and that others were against them. That's all old. The technique that the internet permits is that it allows anonymous, distant actors to reach directly through our pupils, right, into the parts of our brains where the action really is. That's new. And then there are other things which might be new, like, um, like machine learning, right? I mean, that having to deal with um, you know, quadrillions of, uh, of gigabytes of computing energy directed against my lonely cerebrum. That's something new, and that's probably only going to get worse. But, but, but the pattern is old, because what, you know, what a social platform does, or even what a Google search does, is that it learns what it is that you want to hear, and it gives you more of that thing, and thereby slowly changes you. I mean, it, makes, it shifts you away from a person who thinks there are facts out there, 
and more towards a person who just get used, gets used to hearing the things that, that he or she wants to hear. You shift from being a person who could function in the public sphere, in the democracy, to a person who, who can't, right? That, that's, so the, the, the shift is old, it's familiar. The, some of the techniques, though, are a little bit new, and, which doesn't mean that they're inevitably bad. It does mean that we have to recognize, you know, as with the book, that you have to get a handle on these things. You know, the tech is neither good or bad in, on, on its own, but you have to realize what the potential is and, and start to get a handle on what the negative possibilities are because we're, I think we're only beginning to start to see them. People want there to be an easy answer and, and, and that there ain't, right? I mean, so until very recently, people were still arguing, well, you know, Silicon Valley is gonna somehow automatically solve this. You know, inc incentives or the nature of technology is somehow automatically gonna solve this. That's not true. That's the politics of, of inevitability. And then, you know, and then there are the doomsayers who say, yeah, humans are basically irrational. Um, th this is how it always ends. There's nothing we can do about it except wait for some calamity. You know? And that's the politics of eternity. And that, that's also very tempting. But they're both tempting in the same way, which is they say, it's not our fault. You know, we can't really do anything about it. We don't have we don't have responsibility, and of course we do. Okay, so going back to the book, it it, it helped to do things like establish authorship. Um, it helped to do it helped to do things like um, have a have a page of table of contents so it was clear what was being said. It, it, this may seem all totally boring now, but it really mattered to get the technology of the book under control. We can get the technology of the internet under control. Too, provided that we decide that that's an issue, right? Like, I mean, looking at it from the point of view of, of, of the larger economy, why can't we think about the internet the way that we think about other resources? Or why can't we think about our mind the way we think about other resources? If there's pollution, we treat that as an externality and we internalize it, right? The destruction of factuality, we could also treat as an externality, right? We could tax big companies and we could use what we get from those big companies to support local news. Um, because factuality isn't just a matter of like being a crusader for it. It's a matter of producing facts. It's a matter of producing them not in DC or New York or Los Angeles or Beijing or Moscow. It's a matter of producing them where people actually live. And that has to be done. It has to be done by people. It has to be done by local reporters. The trick is not to just to say social platforms bad, internet bad. Um, the trick is to say, how do you produce factuality in people's lives? Because the way, the way the destructive process goes is that first the local news goes away. And this was true in Russia a little bit before. It was true in America. But in both cases, you see the, basically the same pattern. First the local news goes. And then people start talking about the media. Instead of talking about reporters who they know, their neighbors, they start talking about the media as something distant. And once that step is made, once people distrust, they start looking for other things to trust, which are big conspiracy stories. Because if the media is far away from you anyway, why not believe something you know, which makes the world make sense? So part of the answer has to be, how do we recycle some of these enormous profits back from these huge companies into the production of local news? Or to take a slightly different analogy, it's a little bit like reforestation. If you're gonna make huge profits from, from clearing timber, okay, but after a while you realize you have to reforest. If you're gonna make huge profits from driving people towards an us-them version of politics, Maybe at a certain point you have to reforest, you have to replenish, you have to, you have to take some of those huge profits and actually educate people again, right? By, for example, supporting local news. So I think it's not, it's not technically that difficult to do things like this. And there are other things, there are other ways to think about it economically, like for example, that <clears throat> fake news has an unfair competitive advantage over real news. Because, for example, you don't have to employ reporters, and you could try to correct for that, right? So there, there are lots of things that one could do. I mean, you could reclassify, which I think we should do, really. You could reclassify investigative journalism as a public good, which deserves positive public support from, from the state. I think that would be an excellent thing to do. So this, these things can be rejigged. There are technical means. But I think the fundamental answer is we can't say it's going to sort itself out or that it's, it's, or that it's not going to sort itself out. We have to think, yeah, if we like democracy and freedom and the rule of law, those things depend on factuality. If we want factuality, we actually have to go out there and find ways to recreate it in the 21st century. That's, where, that's what history, I mean, that's what I mean by history, is that history can define the problem for you, and then you have to say, am I going to take responsibility for it or not? Mm -hmm.